With, with cultures that are fairly similar, like Australia and America, we can have major problems in communication. And, and, and even subtle differences in behaviour. I remember the first time in California when we invited out for supper. Now, that was a problem. Because in Australia, supper is a snack before you go to bed. We got invited out for supper. I ate. Big meal. Went out for supper. We had to eat again. <laughs> Man, I felt like throwing up at the place, you know. It... <laughs> and then, now this one was interesting. In Australia, you've got to understand, the thing you do in Australia... I mean, to be hospitable and that, when someone leaves your house, you walk down the steps, you go to the car, you wave, you watch the dust peer, disappear down the road. I was shocked the first time we left someone's home, I turned around to say something and the door goes, bang. <laughs> and I thought, we've upset somebody. I was depressed for weeks. Next time we visited somebody, slam. Then I found out that's what Americans do. As soon as they're out of the door, glad to get rid of them, bang. out the... Do you realize I, I culturally had to come to grips with that? And, and then things like, this is an embarrassing one, but I, I remember the time we had a teenage American girl staying with us. We had a little baby at the time, and I was trying to be nice to her, and I said, oh, would you like to nurse our baby? <laughs> I mean, she gave me that strange look. And then I said, well, it doesn't matter, I'll nurse the baby. Well, <laughs> I mean, at that stage, this girl just about dies on the spot, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not communicating, but what's wrong with me? I'm not communicating. I found out later on much to my embarrassment. See, in Australia, nursing a baby just means hold a baby. In America, I found out it means breastfeed a baby. <laughs> I asked her to breastfeed our baby. <laughs> then I said I'd breastfeed the baby. <laughs> Maybe she thought we Australian males were the superior race after all, you know. <laughs> hey, by the way, do you get the point? You can say the same words and they mean different things in a different culture. You know what, friends? We have to come to grips with this. In our Christianized Western world, we've lost the Christian basis. It's a different culture, and we have a problem. We have a problem that most of the church doesn't recognize. You see, when Paul was preaching to the Greeks, they had the wrong foundation. They couldn't even understand the terminology. Do you know what Paul had to do? What Paul had to do was basically take out their wrong foundation, their wrong belief in history. He had to bring in the right foundation, and that's from a human perspective. It's God who changes people's hearts. In a sense, he had to change their whole way of thinking. That's a very difficult thing to do. It's very slow at first. It's hard to do. It's not something that happens overnight. I'm going to tell you, Paul was phenomenally successful to see people converted. He was preaching to pagans, not people who had the foundation. Now, I want to ask you some very, very important questions. This gets very serious. I want you to think for a moment. Generations ago, in America, let's take pre-1960s anyway, back beyond then. Let me ask you a question. Prayer in the schools, creation in the schools, Bible readings in the schools, prayer on football games and graduation, Ten Commandments in the schools, a lot of parents sent their kids to Sunday school and church programs, nativity scenes everywhere. Let me ask you a question. Would you say generations ago, America was more as a type? You know what I mean by a type, right? Was America more like the Jews or more like the Greeks? What would you say? More like the Jews, okay? So therefore, when you preach the message of the gospel, in a sense, people can understand. You say God, they know who you meant. You say Jesus, they know what you meant. You say sin, they know what you meant. I'd say the same was true of England. You know, back before the last war, 40 to 50% of people in England attended church. You go to England today, there's hardly any vestige of biblical Christianity left in the country. Why? Well, I'll tell you why in a moment. But by the way, where England is today is where America will be tomorrow if they don't understand the message that we're giving here today, which is the foundational message, the key to what's happened. I believe it is. I don't want to sound arrogant, friends. I, I really don't. I honestly believe that what we're dealing with here is the key. It's the foundational key as to what's happened. Let me ask you a question. Very important question as we think about this. Let's come up to the present time. Creation thrown out of public schools. The Bible thrown out of public schools. Ten Commandments thrown out of public schools. Prayer thrown out of public schools. The courts throwing out the Ten Commandments and Christian symbols of public buildings and so on. 
Increasingly, parents don't send their kids to church programs. Evolution taught us fact in the education system. By the way, they haven't taken religion out when they threw creation out. They just threw Christianity out and replaced it with a different religion. And that's the religion that you can explain everything without God. And it's about time the public woke up to the fact that the public schools are churches of humanism. That's what they are. Now, as they explain everything without God, not only do they do that, uh, there are a number of them, quite a lot, that teach against Christianity. H how many times have I met students across this nation that go to a college or even a public school where the professor says, hand up the Christians in this class, you won't be at the end of my sessions. That's the sort of thing that's going on. You know what? <laughs> even in public schools, they could pick up the Koran and teach from that and talk about all sorts of pagan religions. They pick up a Bible and start mentioning it. The ACLU will take you to court. I want to ask you a question. Would you say today that increasingly the culture in America, would you say as a type, it's more like the Greeks or more like the Jews? How about that? I got the right answer. The Greeks. Okay. And remember, the preaching of the cross to the Greeks was what? Foolishness. Now, friends, I want you to think really carefully. Then I want you to answer in a loud voice. You agree that the culture as a type was more like the Jews, now it's more like the Greeks. Most evangelistic methods today, most methods of evangelism preached in churches, used in churches, used by missionary organizations, used by evangelists and others, most evangelistic methods, do they assume the culture is like the Jews or the culture is like the Greeks? They assume the culture is like the... But you tell me the culture is like the... You just told me one of the greatest problems with evangelism today. Most of the church is using a method that does not reach increasingly where the culture is at. What happened? Why is that? I mean, you tell me with your own mouths. Why is that? You see, what's happening today is that we've got whole generations coming through an education system that are being put on that Greek road. And, and you know what we're doing? We're out there saying, you sinner, repent of your sin. Increasingly, they haven't got a clue what you're talking about. In fact, that gospel message stuff, that stuff about Jesus, whoever he is, that comes from that book that science has proved you can't trust. I'm not going to listen to that nonsense. The Greeks. And if we want to be successful in evangelism today, we've got to do what Paul did. We've got to recognize if we're going to reach these generations coming through that have a different foundation, it's a different culture, We've got to start at the beginning. Well, what caused this? Because the church gave up the beginning. Because we compromised with Genesis. We added millions of years to the Bible. You know what happened back in the 1700s, 1800s? The idea of millions of years became incorporated into the Bible, reinterpreting the days, reinterpreting the geology. You know what started to happen? The church disconnected the Bible from the real world. The Bible becomes a book of religion, a book of morality. The real world is what they're taught out here in the, in the schools and the universities of millions of years and so on. And the church basically said, we'll leave that up to the schools, leave that up to, to their education over here. But as long as we teach the wonderful Bible stories, the message of Jesus, and as long as we teach them about good morality and, and about right and wrong, that's what we'll do. And you see it reflected in many churches' statement of faiths. You know what they say in their statement of faiths? The Bible is the supreme authority in all matters of faith and practice. But you know what I say? The Bible is a supreme authority in all matters of faith and practice and everything it touches upon. Where it touches upon geology, is it the ultimate authority? Absolutely. Where it touches upon biology, is it the ultimate authority? Absolutely. Astronomy? Absolutely. Anthropology? Absolutely. You know what the Bible, you know what the church did? They gave that up. And the, and the Bible became a book of stories. The real history of the world is what's taught out here. And finally you get generations coming through who realize, wait a minute, if what the world teaches is right, then even the gospel message comes out of that book of stories and that history you can't trust. We've lost our foundation. Now they have a different foundation. And you know what, by and large, the church is doing? Go out and saying, trust in Jesus. He died for your sin. And they're saying, huh? And we wonder why we're not touching the culture. I want us to look at these castle diagrams again. Do you realize the one that has the foundation of evolution, man determines truth, I've now labeled as the Greeks. And the one that has the foundation of creation, God's word is truth, I've labeled as the Jews. You know, the humanists are very clever. 
You know what they realize? They realize this. How do we get rid of that Christian structure? Well, what you need to do is to knock out the foundation of the, of the structure. How do you do that? You get people to disbelieve the history beginning in Genesis. And much of the church has helped destroy their own history. In other words, by attacking that foundation and putting in a different foundation, they've changed the culture to being like the Jews to being like the Greeks. And by the way, that has great bearing on evangelism. For instance, I want you to think about this. If somebody came up to me now and uh, said to me, I'm a homosexual, what are you going to do about it? I want you to think about this for a moment. I'm not going to immediately say to that person, that's wrong, that's evil, you shouldn't do that. You know why I wouldn't do that? I believe those things, but you know why I wouldn't do it? How can I impose my morality on someone if they don't have the foundation to understand it? What I need to do is first of all find out, so why do you believe the way you do? Well, try to find out, what language do you speak? How, how, how do the words I use, how are they interpreted by you? Because isn't it true in this culture, Christians increasingly are looked on upon as intolerant, narrow-minded, bigoted, biased. Isn't that true? You know why? Because we're out there imposing our Christian morality on a culture that by and large has changed foundation. Now, don't get me wrong, we need to stand for Christian morality. Absolutely, and I agree, stand against abortion, homosexual behavior, absolutely. But you understand, if we don't deal with the foundational issue at the same time, it's not going to work. Because there's been a change in foundation. You can't impose the Christian structure on a culture that has a different foundation. It doesn't work. And that's why, in the second diagram of the castles, I'm saying... To change it back from being like the Greeks to being like the Jews, we've got to have a foundational change. We've got to deal with the wrong foundation like Paul did and put in the right foundation so we can build that structure. And by the way, that's a, lot, that's a hard job. It takes a long time. Friends, when I went to England many years ago, I visited Westminster Abbey. In Westminster Abbey, famous people are buried. All sorts of dead people in the church. <laughs> dead people in a lot of church in America do, but <laughs> you know what I mean. But you know, there's a very famous person buried in Westminster Abbey. You know what his name is? His name is Charles Darwin. Do you know how Darwin got buried in the Abbey? And by the way, you know where Darwin is? First time I went there, I couldn't find his grave. I found out I'd been walking over it. It's in the floor, in the floor of the church. Darwin was going to be buried in a little country graveyard. But his cousin, Francis Galton, an ardent humanist, and Huxley, an ardent humanist, they put pressure on Parliament and pressure on the Abbey. And if you do the historical research as we've done, you'll find out, and this is even in secular books, and they admit this, the humanists recognize if they could get Darwin buried in the Abbey, then the church honors Darwin, that will help humanism. And you know what hit me the first time I saw that grave? I looked down and stood there, you know, in fact, tears came to my eyes because I looked there and I thought, Psalm 11.3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? A man who popularized a philosophy to destroy the foundations of the church was honored by the church and buried in the foundations of the church. That's what's happened to England. Everyone knows that they were some of the first to capitulate in a big way in the church over there, incorporate evolution of millions of years into their theology, and look at the church in England today. It's by and large dead. Friends, increasingly the church in America is burying Darwin in the foundations of the church and millions of years and so on. You know what's happening to America? America will become England tomorrow in regard to the church unless the church wakes up and gets back to its right foundation, which is why I believe we need a new reformation in the church to get back to the authority of the word of God. Let me, let me give you a couple of other illustrations here. The parable of the sower and the seed. Let me ask you a question. Isn't it true that the, that the sower, you, you know the parable, don't you? you? You know the different sorts of ground. We're not going to go into the meaning of the parable so much as this. Isn't it true that the sower wanted the seed to fall in prepared ground so he could reap a harvest? Here's what I want to suggest to you. Generations ago in America, there was a lot of prepared ground. It was plowed by the schools, it was plowed by the churches, it was plowed by the homes. There was rocky and thorny ground out there, yes, but the evangelists could come in and throw out the seed of the gospel and there was enough plowed ground there you could get a response and we could see revivals and, and so on. But here's what we have to come to grips with. The same churches, schools and homes have sown seeds of destruction. Contaminated seeds. 
contaminated millions of years, evolutionary ideas, man's theories. And you know what's happened? We've lost our plowed ground. And now we have a church out there saying, oh, well, this is the way we've always spread the gospel in the past. Wow, these weeds are getting worse every day. And we keep throwing the seed out, not considering that the ground is gone. And you know the thing that concerns me? There are people out there in the church from all, my, all different denominations who are out there saying we've got to get back to the family and the anti-abortion and, 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 and dealing with the homosexual issue and, and all these other things, lawlessness and school violence. But you know what I find? The majority of them say, oh, Genesis doesn't matter. That's not important. We've just got to deal with all these issues up here. I'm saying, hang on, hang on. The very, the very reason you won't deal with the foundation and say Genesis is not important, that's the very reason we've got these problems. And you're out there trying, trying to defend the family and other things and you won't deal with the foundation and you've compromised that issue until you deal with your foundation. You're not going to be successful up here. And you know what's increasingly happened? We're out there preaching the message of the cross to a culture that has a Greek foundation and to them it's foolishness. You know, I was over in uh, London not long ago, well actually a year ago, I was in the centre of London. And there was, a, there was a guy, in, in, in the, not far from the Abbey actually, it was one of these busy streets where thousands of people every minute are going past to get to the subways, and he had a, little mic, had a microphone and a little speaker box, and he's there saying, repent of your sin, Jesus is coming back, and <laughs> you need to repent of your sin. How many people stopped and listened to him? Zero. By the way, when Wesley spoke, how many people stopped and listened to him? See, in Wesley's day, it was a different culture. When Moody went over there, it was a different culture. Whitfield was a different culture. You see, he's preaching today to mainly Greeks, but he's using a method for Jews. I admire his zeal. I admire his enthusiasm. But he's not reaching them. It's a different culture. You know, I, uh, I look on the ministry of answers in Genesis like this. It's a plowing ministry, a pioneering ministry. In other words... You know when the pioneers went westward, what, westward, what did they do? They put their wagons in a, in a circle and they said, let's throw out the seed and get a harvest. We'll just wait here for the harvest. You know what they did? They had to work hard to clear the ground, to knock out the rocks. And they didn't get a harvest at first. It's very hard work to get the ground prepared. Friends, that's where we are at in evangelism in America today. Do you realize something? Since the 1700s, when the idea of millions of years was popularized, the late 1700s, we've had over 200 years of intense, evolutionary, uniformitarian, humanistic, millions of years indoctrination that has permeated the culture and changed the culture foundationally. And you know the trouble today? The church who allowed that to happen is looking at the consequences and the results of it, trying to put a band-aid on the top up here to deal with it. And what they've got to realize is, Sadly, I know God is sovereign. God can do anything. From a human perspective, it can't change overnight because it's been something that took 200 years to change the entire foundation. You know what that means? You're not going to get quick results like that. In other words, we live in a culture where if you don't get your hamburger in 22 seconds, you get your money back. We want everything today. And you know what I'm finding increasingly? I'm finding there are churches in America that, that are realizing they're not, they, they, how do you bridge the gap between the church and the world? The world won't come to church. You know what they do? They water down the teaching of the world and they make the church more, look more like entertainment and they make the church look more like the world to attract the world and they get all these, big, all these people in and big mega churches and everything like that and you stand back and have a look at the big picture and the country is getting less Christian every day which means they've missed it. And you'll find that those churches, by and large, will say about our ministry, Ah, oh, answers and genocide side issue, six days, doesn't matter, you can believe in millions, that's not important. That's the very reason we're in the, tru the trouble that we're in. And you know what I see that bulldozer as? See, I see our ministry as a bulldozer coming in to clear the ground, the rocks, the trees. By the way, I've got to be careful where, the, where this sort of thing is shown, because when I was in California, I had someone come up and nearly punch me in the nose. They said, that's an anti-environmental overhead. Or an anti-environmental illustration. So I want to tell you, the trees are symbolic, the bulldozer is symbolic, 